So in feature engineering, the goal is to transform our raw data into tidy data with numerical or categorical features. There are different parts. The first is raw data. So raw data is the data that we have at the beginning. So if we take the example of spam filter, what we have at the beginning is formatted email with a subject with a body that may be HTML that can have some formatting. We have a sender's and recipient's email address. Uh, we have a lot of different metadata. So this is raw data. It is not directly usable for machine learning model. So we have to transform it into something that can be understood by the model. Now, what can be understood by the model? So the model only accepts numerical or categorical features. So we really have to transform whatever is our raw data into uh, only numerical and categorical features. So if we take the example of the email, our first step is to transform the formatted email, formatted HTML to uh, plain text email. That is without any formatting and by keeping only uh, the content of the email. Then our feature engineering part consists of transforming this plain text into some different features. So it can be the frequency of some characters like dollars, uh, exclamation point, etc. Uh, maybe it's... Uh, frequencies of some specific keywords uh, like uh, Viagra, by, mail, etc. So these are the features that uh, so, and these will correspond to the columns in the data set. Maybe we also want to compute things like uh, the average length of the uninterrupted sequences of capital letters. We can come up with a lot of features. Generally, we will need to uh, improve it by making iterations on our feature engineering part to have better representation of our data by the features that we decide. So we have seen that we need tidy data. Now let's try to understand what is tidy data. The requirement for the data to be tidy is that we need one example that corresponds to one row and one row corresponds to one example. So it means that we have to one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between the example and the row of our data. Also there should be a similar one-to-one -one correspondence between the columns and features. So it means that a feature should not be split between columns. The third principle of tidy data is that we need a single data set. If we, if we want, we can think of tidy data as a spreadsheet where each row represents an example and each column represents a feature. There are different sources of messiness that doesn't respect the principles of tidy data. One example can be that column headers are values instead of variable names or identifiers example in case of a transposed data we have features that are in the rows and examples uh, that are in the columns it can be the case that way uh, that we have uh, some values in column headers and it's not a good practice also we if we have multiple variables stored in one column so it can be the case uh, if we have let's say uh, that we have a temperature as a feature and in one column we have both the values of the temperature and the unit because it can be that for some examples we have 20 degree Fahrenheit and for others we have 20 degrees Celsius if it is the case, then what we need here is the first column that represents the numerical value and the other column that represents the unit. The idea here is also that uh, we need to process um, uh, it and to have a single unit. Also here is that maybe uh, we will 
have some features that correspond to a part of the population and others that correspond to the remaining part of the population. But if there are different features, we need to keep them in two separate columns and not to merge them. Also, if we have features that are stored both in rows and columns, it's a source of messiness. Example, if we have uh, multiple types of experimental units stored in the same table, similar to the temperature example that we just talked about, it's, pref it's preferable to have a single unit representing a feature rather than multiple. Let's understand this further with the help of an example. So let's take a look at this example. Let's say we received a raw data from a user which is uh, shown in the left in an Excel uh, spreadsheet. This data as we can see here is not tidy for many reasons. First we can see that the examples which correspond to the people are in the same column. Uh, which is not good uh, because there are these are values in the column headers. Next, we can observe that uh, we have two treatments, A and B. One treatment is linked with all and the other with two. Uh, a rule of thumb is that values that correspond to one feature should be in one column, but as we can observe, uh, here that is split between two rows. So we need to transform this data to have values in rows and feature names or identifiers in column headers, similar to what is shown on the right. As we can see in the table shown on the right, the three features, that is the person itself, the treatment and the result, have been placed in three separate columns conforming to one feature per column rule. The results that we observe is in one column, the treatment is uh, in one column and the person is in another column. In case we need more examples, we can refer to this article here that uh, presented the concept of tidy data because there are a lot of examples inside. It's easy to follow and it's freely available. Now let's try to understand the different steps that we need to follow in feature engineering. In total, there are six steps that we need to follow. First step, we need to define the feature that well represents our example. Usually, we have to involve domain experts for that. So, for example, in case of spam filtering tasks, may, we may want to get advice of experts in spam filtering to know what they think are the characteristics of spam. Sometimes, if you work in some specific domain, it will be really useful to work with experts that know what are the feature variables that we can compute to help the machine learning model to specify what we want to learn. It's good to work with experts in the domain. Another underlying step is to document all the features that we have designed. We can do so by creating a spreadsheet or a JSON file by filling the feature names, its types, ex example, uh, whether it's a categorical feature or a numerical feature, etc. Also defining it uh, if it has any missing values and uh, what does it mean, uh, what is the source of data, etc. It is really important to document that because we may forget later what it corresponds. Also, it's useful for the domain experts to know which features are being utilized or later if you plan to work on the explainability on uh, what columns correspond to which features and the purpose of including these. Documentation is a good practice regardless. Once we know uh, what features we want to use and uh, uh, we have consulted the experts, the next step is to implement these. 
here comes the reproducibility part because uh, we will need to rerun and recheck the computations the computations generally involve data manipulation which are of four types filtering which is selecting only some data transforming which is transforming the columns to make the data consistent an example can be that if we have different units of temperature if we have fahrenheit and celsius well the first thing to do is to transform the column temperature to have everything in degree celsius or everything in degree fahrenheit but not both third one is aggregating uh, as the name suggests here we aggregate everything we need not to worry uh, we will be covering uh, this in the next slide or two and the last one is sorting now let's see um, in detail how to aggregate or summarize data for feature engineering one useful thing uh, can be to transform the data and to summarize them one classical example is churn analysis with churn analysis organizations can predict whether a customer will cancel the subscription of services that the company is providing let's say we have a customer of a mobile phone operator and we want to know whether the customer will soon cancel the subscription or not it is possible to do so because we have the data of previous customers and we know that uh, the, uh, when the previous customers quit the subscription but with that said we have an issue here since we wish to predict something about the customer we have to analyze all the historical data related to the customer example what and how many orders did the customer placed how much amount was spent in purchases by him or her etc it is fairly possible that there is a lot of data per customer now since our customer is one example in the data set which also means that all the information of the customer has to fit in one row but at the moment we have multiple rows of rows of information per customer now what do we need what do we do to summarize the data maybe it makes sense to consider as a feature the average amount or the mean amount of purchases that the client did it may be possible that the client did many small purchases and a few big ones hence it makes sense to use the standard deviation to summarize the data it's a good idea to compute the mean and or the standard deviation in such cases the mean will give us the idea of the center and the standard deviation will tell us how much is the a deviation in terms of average distance is there from the center or the average the standard deviation is specially useful in this case as it allows us to identify if the customer is always making the purchase of similar amount or not if that's not the case and the customer purchase amount vary a lot then it will be a different analysis and maybe the model will be able to use that in some way keeping this in mind uh, we can uh, see that uh, on the right hand side that we have for each user we have the gender the age which are the features that are already available at the level of the user so this data seems tidy what we aggregated from three tables on the left is the mean and the standard deviation of the order amount and the mean and standard deviation of the call duration we can see that uh, this can be useful to summarize the information related to the previous orders that each user did and the previous calls for each user the third step is to encode categorical features this is really important because machine learning models accept only numerical values if we have some categorical feature then we need to encode them in numerical value in the previous example we saw that we have gender uh, which was uh, encoded as f for female and m for male but we 
cannot give directly the alphabets M and F to the machine learning model because the machine learning model only understands numerical values. So what we can do is to encode categorical features into numerical ones. So one type of encoding is called one-hot encoding. This is like putting a mapping. For example, uh, male will be encoded to zero and female to as one. So if we have only two possible features, we can transform it like this. If we need to have uh, uh, more, then we split it in several features. So here is an example shown uh, for the diploma. We may have a combination of a high school, bachelor's and master's diploma. So we can transform these three um, values into three features. For the sake of example, we can see that uh, if the user has no high school, dip high school or master's diploma and has only a bachelor's diploma, then the value will be 010, which is exactly the first row. The first column represents the high school diploma, the second one is for bachelor's and the third one uh, represents a master's diploma. Only a master's diploma without high school and bachelor's diploma can be represented as 001, which is the second row. And we can imagine many combinations are possible for the sake of example. So we can encode it this way. One thing to be careful with numerical encoding is to use it logically. Let's say in case of days of the week, we have we can have zero for Sunday, one for Monday, two for Tuesday and so on. So we will uh, have values as zero to six representing Sunday to Saturday. If we give this feature to the model, the model will understand that Sunday, that is zero, is close to Monday, that is a one. But it may not be able to understand that Saturday, that is six, is also close to Sunday, represented by zero. The model may interpret that the most farther apart days are Sunday and Saturday, which is not true. So this scenario should be carefully dealt with. What would be a good way to encode it is uh, to do the same thing as we did for diploma example. Similarly, we can have uh, one feature that corresponds to Sunday, second feature that corresponds to Saturday, etc. for the days of the week. This is also valid for example of region numbers. So if we have uh, different regions in a country, uh, each region having a number but we cannot give this number directly to the classifier because if we do so then the model uh, <clears throat> may uh, think that there is some sort of continuity between uh, the regions having the numbers closer to each other which may or may not be the case it depends on country so uh, it doesn't make sense to consider a region number as a feature. What we can do next is to discretize continuous variable. So this is optional, uh, this is not mandatory, but sometimes it can help our model to make some discretization. What it means that um, if we have a continuous variable, for example, age, which is continuous, um, we can create categories. As mentioned here in the slide, the categories created are less than 18 years old, between 18 to 50 years old, and more than 50 years old. We can code it uh, similarly uh, to the diploma example now, uh, once we have the categories. This is optional because we can just um, give it uh, to the model, uh, the age, but generally, uh, it was shown that in some cases, um, it can help a lot to discretize uh, uh, values because uh, sometimes relation may uh, be complex or maybe we can also incorporate some previous knowledge. For example, um, we, we know that uh, less than 18 years old are considered as minors 
and uh, we have some restrictions as compared to the adults. So it can make sense to incorporate that kind of knowledge uh, that uh, the model can learn more easily. So let's continue with further steps. The next step that we uh, don't have to forget is to treat missing data. Uh, that is really important because uh, some models accept missing data, but most models don't. So we really have to transform missing data. One solution can be if we have categorical features uh, is to uh, give a special category to missing data. So we assume that, for example, we have uh, uh, the gender. Uh, in the gender, we have male, female, but maybe uh, we don't know for some people what the category is. And then we can create a third category, which is unknown. Another solution is also called imputation. So in that case, uh, in imputation, we will try to find some method, some heuristic to replace missing values by the common value, by the most common value. So if we have, let's say, 80% of females, well, uh, maybe we can replace some missing data by the value representing the females because of its frequency domination, dominance in the data set. So sometimes it can be better uh, to use imputation. For um, uh, example, if uh, we can uh, have only a few examples of missing values and uh, we don't want to remove these, uh, uh, maybe it makes sense to consider imputation uh, because we don't want to create a specific category, for example. Uh, an unknown gender if we don't know only one or two in the of the cases in the world data set so we have to keep in mind that uh, this is a, a probable solution but uh, the important thing is not to forget about treating the missing data generally model will uh, not be able to learn or train if we have missing data sometimes we have to manually treat these in the pre-training phase. Another important thing uh, to not forget is uh, data normalization of continuous features. So if we have some continuous features, generally it helps a lot to normalize data. To perform normalization of data, uh, one solution is to rem uh, remove the mean. So we abstract the mean from each feature and then we divide it by some scale so that we can have a unit variance. So that's the standard deviation and variance is equal to 1 for each feature. This can help uh, most of the models to uh, perform better during training if we normalize the data. Because if we have such data, uh, the range scale will be the same among the variables. So it will be easier for the model to help uh, to find a meaningful value to estimate its parameter during training phase. It is intuitive if we have uh, features that take very small value and another that has uh, comparatively much higher value, then it... Uh, may be really hard for most models to come up with the appropriated uh, parameters. Thus, normalization of continuous uh, features can help uh, a lot of times. Another um, optional thing to do is uh, some feature transformation. One type of feature transformation is to add polynomial features. One example can be uh, to add uh, features by squaring them. Uh, here we have an example of x1 and x2 as two features and we add x, x1 but also x1 squared. Similarly for x2 and x2 squared. Additionally, if we expect some interaction between variables, we may also want um, to add x1 multiplied by x2 uh, it can help in certain cases. Now let's see um, what are the few uh, practical suggestions that may, we may find useful. 
Firstly, we need informative features. Informative features means that for the model to be able to learn, the model needs high predictive power features. Basically, it needs features that we will uh, be able to use to train. If we give some random features, uh, features that are generated by randomly flipping a coin, the model will not be able to learn anything because um, in case of supervised learning, it's not related to the label and there is no information inside the data that can be linked with the label. We cannot just give uh, any random data that uh, doesn't have predictive power to the model. For the model to learn, it uh, has to be able to access informative features that have signals and information. The data that is constant and uh, doesn't change is useless with respect to machine learning. For example, um, in spam filtering case, uh, if we have a feature that says um, if it's a spam, oh, sorry, if it's an email or not, then it will always be one. Hence, it's not necessary to include this feature. Similarly, in a diploma example, if uh, all the people in our data set have uh, the same diploma, um, well, it's not useful to add it. Constant features are not useful. Also, totally unrelated features that are not useful, as we talked about earlier. If we add a feature that is basically uh, coin flipping, uh, something which is not related to the label, um, it will not be useful to train on. If we have um, also some uh, duplicated features, uh, it's not useful either. Uh, for example, um, if we have uh, the weight in kilogram and also the weight in pounds, and uh, there is a direct relation between the, the two, then it's not useful to use both. Another advice is to always check and uh, think about missing data uh, when we code. Um, when we uh, want to transform a variable, uh, we have to always think uh, what will be uh, what will happen if uh, we give a missing uh, data. Here is an example of uh, in Python language. We have a function named transform underscore gender. Um, if we give a single value equal to the word male, the function will return 0, else 1. Now, if we have missing data that is passed to the function, regardless of its value, the function will return 1. We will lose the information that the gender of this example is missing, and we will categorize it wrongly as female. We always need to think of the missing data. Also, when advice is to think of all the data analysis tools that can be of any help. We think, uh, uh, we need to think uh, of uh, descriptive uh, statistics that can help us. Example, mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, quantiles, absolute and relative frequencies, etc. We need to think if plots can be of any help or figures in data visualization to help us finding meaningful features and analyzing these to see if there are some errors or to figure out uh, features that are not useful, etc. Another useful thing to do is to use some uh, small sample to develop and debug. Once we are done with both feature engineering, if we uh, work on data that is pretty big, it can take a lot of uh, computation uh, resources to run. If we take only a small portion of our data, it will be much easier for us to develop and debug in the beginning. If we plan to experiment on a small portion of the data set, we need to cross verify to see if the data is consistent without any missing values when shifting from smaller samples to the main data set. We can think, uh, sorry, we can use um, a unit test for each data extractor 
for uh, each transformation for each computation of our features it can be useful as well now deep learning has been mentioned a few times in the uh, previous lecture let's try to understand deep learning in the context of feature engineering Deep learning being a part of representation learning doesn't have any feature engineering. We give raw data to the model and the deep learning model has to learn uh, both the features and how to use these to predict. Since um, there is no uh, feature engineering part, we may think that, well, it's great because feature engineering is really hard and it can be costly it takes a lot of time uh, a lot of computations so it can be good that we do not have it in here but this comes with uh, a great disadvantage of big cost first we need an insane amount of examples generally we think uh, we can think of uh, thousands or to ten, tens of thousands of examples in uh, classical uh, machine learning but uh, with deep learning, we generally uh, are talking in millions. For uh, sure, I mean, it, it depends uh, on the complexity of our task uh, because in, uh, in comparatively simpler tasks, we don't need millions of examples. But um, if we are talking in terms of images that are not very small, uh, then we need millions of images to be able to learn uh, meaningful representation from deep learning. Also, it comes with the cost in terms of computational resources because deep learning consumes a lot, of, uh, lot more resources than uh, when we train and predict. Also, it comes with the cost of uh, in terms of complexity to code but nowadays we have a lot of libraries that we can uh, that can help us a lot to code in deep learning but still um, it comes with a big cost in terms of computation so let's see uh, when not to use deep learning although it is obvious when uh, to not use deep learning it is advisable not to use deep learning for just for its hype. Um, unless we really uh, have complex problems, we don't need deep learning. Classical machine learning should be enough for simple problems and will save a lot of time. Now let's come back to the machine learning project lifecycle um, and see the next step in detail. The next step in machine le learning lifecycle is model building so uh, model building includes choosing a model for our task and also training it basically model building is the construction of our model let's gain an understanding of the things to be considered to choose the right model for our task uh, 